Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second of our Fall Art in Focus lectures, co-sponsored by Stony Brook University Libraries. I'm Helen Harrison, director of the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center, and I want to thank Chris Kretz, the library's head of academic engagement, for his help in organizing the series, which is supported by Stony Brook's John H. Marburger III Fund. Today's talk is quite a departure for us since we normally focus on abstract art, although if you think about it, notwithstanding its hyper-detailed technique, Arthur Schick's art reveals the essence beyond superficial appearance, which is also abstract art's aim. His grotesque visual satires push realism over the top, and while their critique of fascism and Nazism are specific to the World War II era, the warning they sound is just as urgent today but I'll ask Philip Eliasoff to introduce you to Schick's work, which is currently on view at the Fairfield University Art Museum. So please hold your questions and comments until after his talk or put them in the chat and we'll address them during the follow-up Q&A. Philip, who received his doctorate from Binghamton University, is a professor of art history and visual culture at Fairfield University and special assistant to the president for arts and culture. Among his many contributions, he was instrumental in establishing Fairfield's Carl and Dorothy Bennett Center for Judaic Studies and was the founding director of the Thomas J. Walsh Art Gallery. In 1996, Philip founded and remains the director and moderator of the Open Visions Forum, the university's well-known public affairs series. As an art historian, he is the author of numerous books and studies, including works on Adolf Dane, Colleen Browning, Robert Vickery, and Paul Cadmus. He has also written art reviews for the Stanford Advocate, Greenwich Time, and Connecticut Post newspapers. He was the co-president and co-founder of the Town of Fairfield Arts Council. As commissioner for the Connecticut Commission for Cultural and Culture and Tourism, he served in Hartford under the Department of Community Economic Development from 2009 to 2014, and was a founding trustee of the Connecticut Arts Foundation in 2016. And that is an abbreviated biography. So I'm very happy to introduce Philip, who will introduce you to Arthur Schick. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and of course, uh, this project I've been working on, the, the art of Author Schick now for over three years, uh, and we've celebrating a great exhibition at Fairfield University recent that just opened at the end of September. Uh, all of this seems to be in a almost in a new context as uh, the events in Israel and Gaza and uh, seem to have put a, a, a strange uh, veil over much of the celebratory events of this, but. Nevertheless, let's go forward. Uh, let go forward here. And this is our exhibit that uh, you're all welcome to. You can, there's a very rich uh, on-site uh, online material. And if you make it up here to Connecticut, we'd love to see you at the University Art Museum. Let's meet author Schick. This is a short video made by Universal Studios in 1946. I'm not hearing the audio, Philip. I think you need to click on that, um, the, do the double bars at the bottom. Is the sound not coming through? No, you need to click on those two bars at the bottom left of the image. Mm -hmm. Still don't hear it.
Yeah, we're we're not hearing the sound. All right, we're not. We'll we'll go forward if we're not getting the sound. Uh, so I would like to introduce uh, Shik to you and ask some questions in terms of um, who was Arthur Shik and why are we not more aware of his role in American art history. Uh, he seems to have slipped off of the radar screen. Uh, Stephen Heller, well-known art director, um, has said that the work of Schick has largely been ignored or minimized by art historians, even those specializing in Jewish art and artistic representations of the Holocaust. One could argue that considering his complete devotion that Schick becomes perhaps the most significant 20th century Jewish artist whose life is dedicated to honoring the people of Israel and the visual traditions of Judaism. In an interview in 1944, he said, the Jewish artist belongs to the Jewish people. He is the international ambassador scattered all over the globe. His task is to reveal to the world our great art treasures, to acquaint it with our glorious past as with our tragic present. His life seems to be directed towards his role as a, an ambassador of the Jewish people. Well, in an indirect way, I'll just share with you to personalize my own work on this subject. There's a wonderful word in uh, in Yiddish, the word bershert, and all of this work on author Schick seems to have been a convergence of my own interest, uh, my work on uh, academic realist uh, representational art, my own interest in art and politics and propaganda. I was um, active in the anti-war movement back in the late 60s, um, became interested in the work of Paul Cadmus and the, the work of gay artists. Um, and for the past 30 years, I've been lecturing at my own school about Jewish art, teaching a class Moses to modernism. And somehow all of this seemed to converge in my own work uh, and why this became so exciting for me. Uh, I'm the great grandson of Rabbi Moses Eliasoff, who was a rabbi in Quebec and Montreal. My grandmother, Paula, was a graduate of uh, Pratt in 1913, life member of the American Watercolor Society, life member of the Art Students League. And she worked very closely with Child Hassam in, beginning in 1928 until his death in 1935. And she is the co-author of the Hassam uh, catalog resume of his dry point etching. So I even feel that part of this work almost comes out of my own heritage. And as I said, I was, while many people were uh, protesting the war, I became fascinated with the Art Workers Coalition. And so that was another relationship of the connection of art and politics. Well, art and politics leads to an interest in how one uses political art, caricature, burlesque, and how using ludicrous exaggeration of the characteristics of a subject becomes a perfect tool for belittling, humiliating, inflated uh, dictators and tyrants. The, the use of caricature in art, going back to whether Bosch or the work of Paul Cadmus, which has fascinated me, or R. Crumb, is you know that comment that Juvenal said in the streets of Rome that one really tells the truth through laughter. And in, in terms of narrative, strongly driven, literal narrative realism, we see that the work of Cadmus, who I devoted much of my career and the work of Schick has a, a, a real kinship, a real similarity in style and mannerism. Now, Schick has a very prolific life. He journeys across Europe. He 
focuses on themes of the Hebrew Bible, Jewish culture, and during the Third Reich, he begins to take up his pen uh, fighting against the annihilation of the Jewish race. Uh, he arrives in New York and will become very popular among the magazine uh, art editors doing covers and illustrations for Collier's, Esquire, Fortune, Liberty, Look, Time, and uh, over 200 uh, cartoons that appeared in newspapers, including PM and the New York Post. Now, Schick is a very enigmatic uh, figure coming out of his childhood in Lodz, Poland. He travels to Paris as a young man. He's 15 years old before World War I. He travels to Paris. He takes art classes in Paris. He returns to Paris to set up his studio where he becomes a very well-known illustrator, illustrating um, books of, of Jewish uh, history. And then he'll be doing books like uh, Hans Christian Andersen's Fairy Tales and Chaucer. And I find this image that, that he painted in Paris in 1927 kind of psychological self-portrait. Uh, you look at it and one thinks that you're looking at a um, medieval uh, recitation of Holbein's Sir Thomas More and the Frick. And yet, if you look very carefully, we realize that there are complete historical anachronisms in this medieval town that looks like it's in maybe Bruges or somewhere in Flanders. We see an aeroplane of the 20s. We see a locomotive. And then curiously, in the upper right, there's a Picasso painting. Uh, it's a, And uh, it's even more detailed, a, a US dollar bill uh, framed by two uh, putai. And my thought then is that for Schick, uh, as a young artist, he's in Paris, he's he's very disinterested in uh, avant-gardist work, even though he's a Jewish artist in Paris, he, we have no evidence of him connecting with Modigliani or Soutine or young Chagall. Um, and he's there's these are internalized contradictions He's very proudly Jewish, but he is uh, a Polish nationalist and he is decorated by the Polish government. He is a fervent Zionist from his first trip to uh, Palestine in 1915. He, he goes on an archaeological expedition, but you'll see that his work expresses universalist humanist ideas. He's a medievalist in spirit, but he's very modernist in his caustic uh, 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 tax on um, political figures. He is decidedly an anti-avant-gardist, and yet somehow he ends up at the cutting edge of satire and political art. So he is truly an enigmatic figure at this point. Now, one of my favorite uh, snapshots of the American art world is this full page from PM Magazine, that was uh, drawn by Ad Reinhardt, How to Look at Modern Art in, in America. This was in February of 1946. And PM was a fascinating publication. It leaned left. It was funded by a multimillionaire Marshall Field. And it was uh, very much uh, uh, against uh, the America First isolationism. Now, if you look carefully, this is a tree of modernism. Uh, looks like Alfred Barr's chart of you know modernism from the Museum of Modern Art, and you see at the trunk of the tree are the School of Paris and of the founders Brock, Matisse, Picasso. And then, as we go up into the leaves, the budding leaves up at the up at the top here, if you can see up here in the top, are Pollock misspelled. Krasner misspelled, Hoffman, Motherwell, Rothko. And what's really fascinating is down here seems to be a type of cemetery, a graveyard of all of the has-beens of the 30s, the artist who grew into the WPA 
Paint America social realist movement. And if we look down in this these graveyard, a cornfield, maybe a pun of corny, corny artist, let's take a look into the graveyard and there just three graves away from each other interred in their obsolescence ignominiously we have mr cadmus and mr schick and uh you know i found that in in their being has beens they were sharing in the same type of exclusion along with benton and wood and curry and marsh and and kroll and poor of the new york school well, they were, here are their real graves, incidentally. Mr. Cadmus is buried at the Grove Street Cemetery in New Haven, and Mr. Schick is buried at the Mont New Montefiore Cemetery out in Suffolk. But they were outsiders of their own time, whether through their intolerances of homophobia or anti-Semitism, uh, it's good to know that we're taking a new second look at these artists. Now, here's a map of a, I call this the map of a wandering Jew from Luj to New Canaan, the Yiddishkeit illuminator to Yankee satirist. Uh, Schick is, comes from a, a middle, upper middle class family, well-educated family uh, in the textile business. Luj was a textile center in, in Poland. Uh, he, as I said, he goes back to Paris in the 20s lives uh, in the Marais district for most of the time with his wife, Julia, raises his two children. Uh, they're born in Paris. Then in 1937, he will go to London. And then as the world becomes more and more, as the veil of Nazism crosses Europe, he leaves London in 1940. He makes his way to Halifax, uh, arriving in Halifax in 1940 through the Polish and British embassy in Ottawa. He receives a visa to arrive in New York. He arrives in the fall of 1940 and he'll be living in New York on the Upper West Side. And then he, we know that he is renting beach houses in Westport, Connecticut, in the Campo area. And then he will purchase a home in New Canaan, Connecticut, 1946. And this home, a beautiful country, uh, really a beautiful uh, gentleman's property, uh, he will die of a tragic of a heart attack in 1951 at age 57. He was so renowned at the time that he arrived that the Halifax Herald says that the famed Polish artist was arriving with a price on his head. Um, Adolf Hitler was very sensitive to his press, and we know that uh, he kept an enemies list, and Schick uh, was very high up. He was already a, a, uh, one of Hitler's known uh, artistic enemies, sort of on the Nixon-like enemies list at that time. Now, here, everybody, I want you to bear with me because... Here comes a very problematic moment in this discussion. And it's a problematic discussion that comes after years of my own wrestling with this, of the notion or the question of what is Jewish art? Uh, this is a problem, of course, that becomes one that folds into the identity issue, or I will call it the identity politics of present, and one which I think becomes one that the more we air it, uh, the more problems uh, it, it arise. Uh, you know, I, I find it, it between uh, the, the shofar, the, the particularism of the mouthpiece of the shofar, I love this illustration from the late 14th century of this shofar player who is blowing from the very particular, meaning a very specific Jewish point of view, to this woman in the Negev desert recently blowing to the to the open end of the bell, to the universality. Let's go a little further into that. Uh, 
over the last uh, decades, I have brought my art, my, my Jewish art class to the Jewish Museum on numerous trips. We get up into the permanent collection. And for some reason, this painting by uh, Royal Acad uh, Academician Solomon Alexander Hart, the Feast of the Rejoicing of the Law, Simcha Torah, at the synagogue in Livorno, wonderful Victorian painting, rich in detail, but let's understand a blasphemous painting, a not kosher painting. This painting has so little to do with the so-called subject of Jewish art. Its whole, its whole platform completely defies the iconophobia of the second commandment, uh, it completely defies the idea the, in its literalism and its narrativism. It is, you know, a painting which could be a could be designed anyone from Masaccio to uh, Bougaro. It's a completely academic painting that happens to take place in the synagogue in Livorno. But in terms of it being a representative of the essence of Judaism or Jewish liturgy, it's a completely blasphemous painting. And those issues of, of decoration versus minimalism are so apparent. And so we should put that into the discussion here, for example, the Church of the Jesu in Rome, resplendent in its high Baroque uh, virtuosity versus the Norman Jaffe's very quiet, very minimalist Jewish center of the Hamptons, the tomb of St. Ignatius versus the Bima and uh, Aron Kodesh, the Ark in Hampton. This is a completely different aesthetic. But I like to say to my friends, you don't have to believe Philip on this. Um, I I'll bring you to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. I, I hope that many of you have visited the Israel Museum. And after walking through uh, 3,000 years of Jewish art, so-called in parentheses, or even going back to the pre-Canaanite period, you walk into the souvenir gift shop of the Jewish Museum and lo and behold, I'm afraid to say that all that you can really buy there are trinkets are objects that are you know lovely ceremonial you can buy a menorah or a mezuzah but in terms of art let's go on the left side look at the vatican museum gift shop where i think anyone who's taken art history 101 would appreciate that basically the treasury of western imagery um, going back to the Greco-Roman uh, naturalism through the great works of the, of Michelangelo and Raphael are all there. So the question about what is Jewish art is, uh, again, difficult to shoehorn into, we'll call it, the, the expanse of the Western tradition of the arts. Uh, and here's where the, the world of of Pollock, Krasner, Rothko becomes, Helen Frankenthal or Gottlieb becomes more uh, finely tuned. Uh, and that is if a historian or one looks at the sweep of 3000 years of Jewish history, uh, at least from my perspective, the very zenith is the art world of Manhattan of the 1950s. That, this is where rather, rather oddly or by accident, this is the, the great age, the apex of abstraction. And uh, this is where uh, a culture of the Jewish artist uh, takes the center stage uh, in the history of art. I mean, let's open up one's uh, art history, you know, college art history textbook, and you have more Jewish artists emerging out of this moment of the uh, the great age of abstraction. 
Freud in his iconoclastic way talked about, well, let's understand that for the Jews, it is their in, the invisible deity. And Freud speaks about, quote, the abstract model of experience. Uh, Amos Oz at a speech before he died, I remember being at the old, at the 92nd Street Y, and I like the way Amos Oz said, you know, let's face it, Jews, in fact, help to shape modernity. Uh, and that, let's just go a little further with that and understand that instead of these imitative historicisms of some of the great synagogues that one might visit, whether it's the Tempio Israeliatico in Firenze, which looks like some kind of Moorish uh, redo, or the Doheny Street Synagogue in Budapest. Uh, these are dramatically contrasted with, ah, that's Jewish. Those are great Jewish masters. Uh, Herbert Ferber at Milburn, New Jersey. Uh, Louise Nevelson's White Flame of the Six Million of the Temple Bethel in Great Neck. Uh, certainly Philip Johnson is not, not Jewish. He's paying penance for his flirtation with Nazism in the 30s. But uh, the KTI synagogue in Porchester is one of the most uh, one of the most extraordinary modernist buildings. So here, Judaism and abstraction and modernism are all beautifully tied together. Uh, I hope some of you recently enjoyed the Oppenheimer film, and uh, we understand that the majority of the of the physicists at Los Alamos were Jews. Uh, what is it, what was going on at the Bronx High School of Science? What was going on at Brooklyn College? What was going on that the Jews who had no connection to the visual arts were using in their uh, noggins, in their noodles, thinking about the abstraction of nuclear fusion and fission. Quite fascinating. So the critical question that I'm asking in this uh, setting up my argument about author Schick is, as we look at the masters who of 20th century art, M Modi, Chagall, Frankenthaler, Rothkowitz, what was Judaism, can anyone argue that Judaism was the core raison d'etre of their art? And I think, frankly, the answer is not really. We know Chagall did those wonderful windows for the Hadassah Hospital and did a series that have devoted to the, to the Bible. I know that. But, I mean, are we really going to focus on Modi or Chagall or, or Gottlieb or Rothko, and let's go and understand that the unique nature of this, of the irascibles, whether it's Rothko, Gottlieb, Frankenthaler, Krasner isn't in this photo, uh, Hedda Stern is in this famous photo, is that let's take, you know, realistically a snapshot of the mood and attitude of the Jewish artist, uh, most of them were the grandchildren of, of Orthodox and very observant Jews, like Rothko. Uh, but we understand by the 40s, most of them were FDR leftists, socialists, secularists, some were Trotskyites, very cosmopolitan, universalist. Jewish intellectuality would definitely permeate the birth of the New York School and uh, the, you know, the two cardinals, uh, I won't say grand rabbis, but I'll say the two cardinals were Greenberg and Rosenberg. And they're, you know, decidedly um, skeptical about their, whether they are going to see themselves out in the world as um as observant Jews, but they, it is their intellectuality which defines this golden moment in the history of New York and why New York stole 
the idea of modernism from Paris. And, you know, just as an afterthought, Warhol's 10 famous Jews of the 20th century, it's a great, such a great image. But here again, one, one questions, one tries to define what is it about the Judaism, whether it's uh, whether it's Gershwin or or Golda Meir, what is defining them as Jews? To some degree, then, I was my thinking has been shaped very much by an exhibit at the Jewish Museum in 1996. Norman Kleeblatt uh, curated this, um, and the title of the show I think was spot on. It was simply "Too Jewish," "Too Jewish," where themes of Judaism were suddenly being embraced after a generation of artists who had um, either intentionally hidden their Judaism, let's say Philip Guston, or I have been working on a major American artist whose family refused to allow me to publish that the family name was a Jewish immigrant name, and I had to abandon this book project that I had spent a year writing because this family did not want it to be known that this was, that the uh, artist was raised in a Jewish family. So the idea of being too Jewish was something at least until the 50s that was not a comfortable uh, costume to wear. But for Schick, he says, almost using the rhythm of the Shema prayer, I am resolved to serve my people with all my heart, with all my talent, with all my knowledge. He is not in any way going to camouflage or disguise. He is going to be the representative, the ambassador of the Jewish people as he, as an immigrant coming arriving to New York in 1940. Now he's trained at the Academy Julian in the 20s. He becomes just an extraordinarily gifted miniaturist. His work then comes to uh, fruition in what is one of the greatest books uh, ever published in the English language, uh, the Sheikh Haggadah, which was published in 1940, using the, the feel and microscopic uh, miniaturism of the 14th and 15th century manuscripts. In fact, the Sheikh Haggadah, some of you might have later uh, editions of it that your father or grandfather or parents would bring out during Passover for those in the audience tonight who would be celebrating. Um, the Sheikh Haggadah is something of a legendary publication. It, it took him about six years to produce the pages, the 42 illustrations. Uh, it was created in an edition of 250 copies. It sold in London during the Blitz for $500 a copy. Recent edition was auctioned at Sotheby's for $60,000. Now, Schick, when he decides that he's going to be tell the story of the Jewish people, he will ad adopt the methodology of Carl Jung and transform Jewish biblical heroes into Jungian archetypes so that, so that he'll take the Saint Martin of Aragon and turn that into an illustration of the Simon of the Bar Kokhba revolt. He's essentially transposing the archetypal imagery of the hero, the Jungian and the Joseph Campbell idea of the hero, and using this as his vehicle to um, show the excitement about uh, Jewish uh, history. And so he also takes on this idea that he is a, he likes to self-referentially call himself a Jewish soldier in art. And so often he puts a spear or a weapon in his hand, but we understand for the illustrator, it is the pen, the ink pen and the sable brush. By the 1930s, he understands that he's going to have to give up his career as one of the most successful book 
and commercial illustrators in Paris. And he realizes with his family living in Poland, he is uh, making uh, in intermittent visits to his family in Poland. But he is living in London by the 30s and he begins to watch what is going to happen. So he begins to understand that he wants to create the Jewish hero as the modern Maccabees. He wants to paint Jewish he heroism. And this illustration, I was at a symposium two weeks, uh, two weeks ago at the Center for Jewish History in New York, a symposium called Fighting Fascism. And uh, I had a great feedback from the audience when I showed this really prescient image in 1933. Hitler had just been appointed chancellor and already he's depicting Hitler in the guise of Pharaoh, meaning this new chancellor that the German nation thinks is going to lead them out of the out of the humiliation of the Weimar Republic and of the World War I Treaty of Versailles, that he begins to understand using a cartooning language here that he is the new Pharaoh oppressing the Jewish people. Here is a magnificent illustration. There are 42 pages from the Schick uh, Haggadah. And I'm pleased to share with you that when the new George Lucas Museum opens the Museum of Illustration uh, in Los Angeles, which is scheduled to open in 2025, the 42 pages of the Schick Haggadah are now part of the George Lucas collection. I show you this because in this uh, narrative format, he's already taking on the idea of freedom, like the Passover uh, story, freedom from slavery, ancient tyrants and modern tyrants. And so we see it consistently that it is the freedom fighters, whether it's Moses with the overseer, it's the uh, patriots at the Battle of Concord Bridge, or whether it's Israeli male and female soldiers winning the War of Independence, he will take on these archetypes. Now we come to the turning point of 1940. Let's think about America in 1940. America was at, was at peace. By 1940, we already know that uh, Germany had invaded uh, Poland, September 1939. Um, the, the, there were already nine concentration camps built in Germany by 1940. And here comes onto the stage the Democrat versus, and America was decidedly uh, isolationist. I hope some of you watched Ken Burns' magnificent series on the U.S. and the Holocaust. Um, there was uh, absolutely no will to join in on another, uh, in this cartoon, mad war in Europe. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt wanted to support uh, the British allies. Uh, Churchill and Roosevelt were quietly trying to figure out how the, uh, the Anglo-American allies would help each other. Uh, we have this, the Democrat and the uh, dictator. And the dictator is seen in this uh, harrowing image. Uh, it was, this was painted in 1942 by Arthur Schick. It was used for the New York Times book review at the in the closing months of the war, March of 1945. And here, if you look carefully in the hair, it says, uh, Vi Victus, Vi Victus, woe to the vanquished. Uh, now, the image of Hitler will become the key image of Schick's anti-Nazi, anti-fascist work. And let's think about how the American public was looking at these images once the war began. Um, on the left is, this is Dr. Seuss's um, uh, cartoon. Uh, in the middle is Dr. again, Dr. Seuss, another cartoon. And Walt Disney turned over to the Office of War Information the 
uh, all of the facilities of the Disney studios um, to uh, help with the war effort. Disney says all cartoon characters and fables must be exaggeration and they must be caricatures. Recently, I interviewed Art Spiegelman and uh, in his epic and Pulitzer Prize winning Mouse series, uh, winner of the Pulitzer Prize in 1992. He does, he does not do any illustrations really of Hitler other than this cover. Incidentally, this is this book cannot be sold in Germany because of the imagery of Hitler, which is verboten in modern Germany. In the Gallup poll, in the week after the invasion of Poland, 84% of the US public is non-interventionist, does not want any American troops to be sent to defend England or to free Europe. Let the British take on the Third Reich. America was going to be out. Of course, we had a very strong uh, America First movement and flirtations with Nazism in America. Sinclair Lewis writes, it can't happen here about what happens if fascism comes to America. And more recently, Philip Roth's memorable, The Plot Against America. Jews are the cause of the warmongering public. Uh, we're not going to enter into another world war as we see here in this uh, headline from the Seattle newspaper, the Washington New Dealer, American people say no. Uh, cartoons are showing uh, very anti-Semitic images. President Rosenfeld uh, stating that Jews are the cause of high taxes, slavery, starvation, and death need to break the Jew control before our country is totally destroyed. And very unflattering with large noses and very unflattering uh, uh, facial caricaturism. Justice Bernard Baruch, Treasury Secretary Herman, Henry Morgenthau, and Benjamin Cohn, FDR's senior advisor. So this is the mood of America in 1940 that Schick arrives in. He does this cartoon that is published in the American Mercury magazine, uh, which shows the Statue of Liberty, a madman's dream is the title of it, uh, with the face of Hitler as the Statue of Liberty, holding on the, to, the, to the Constitution filled with swastikas. And I bring your attention, please, to the lower left and lower right. We'll look at these figures holding up this Nazified Statue of Liberty, because if you look on the left, we have the golden boy, America's greatest hero and leader of the America First movement, um, Lucky Lindy, who flies the Atlantic in 1927, um, who is shown here at the base of the Statue of Liberty, uh, wearing a swastika on his armband. And on the lower right, we see a jovial uh, figure of Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering, who is awarding Lucky Lindy the Reich's service cross in a big ceremony in Berlin. Well, it gets worse, everybody, because the flirtations with Nazism take us to um, a quiet, beautiful New England town of Southbury, Connecticut, quaint town up in Litchfield County. And um, here, the American Bund uh, wants to create a Nazi training camp, the General von Steuben camp. And were it not for the good citizens of Southbury who stood up and said, we do not want swastikas, we do not want Nazis in our midst. And led by Reverend Felix Manley, the pastor of the Southbury Federated Church, the people of Southbury for, were able to stop in its tracks this uh, training camp for the American Bund. Now, uh, some of us remember going to uh, Madison Square Garden, uh, the old Madison Square Garden, and many of us or our parents or grandparents would go and enjoy 
games of the New York Knicks and uh, New York Yang Rangers. But let's visit Madison Square Garden on that night in 1939, February 20, 1939, um, George Washington Day, a mass demonstration of the America First movement, 22,000 Nazi, American Nazis holding a rally in Madison Square Garden, saluting uh, Nazi uh, banners and with a 30 foot high portrait of President George Washington here as uh, American Fuhrer Fritz Kuhn talks about a white Gentile ruled America. Uh, please join us, go to the Fairfield University Art Museum site. We're happy to have you as part of the live stream next Wednesday, November 1 at 5 p.m., where Arnie Bernstein will be speaking to us from Chicago about his book, Fritz Kuhn and the Rise and Fall of the German-American Bud Swastika Nation. You know, everybody, uh, I used to drive across the 59th Street Bridge with my dad and our old Oldsmobile, 19, late 50s, I was a little boy. And I got to tell you, I'm just sharing a very personal my dad, when we would turn down York York Avenue and First Avenue, my dad would suddenly get, and he remembered as a teenager, the Nazi Bund uh, in the Upper East Side. And he, he would tell me, you know, uh, Philip, uh, this was dangerous as a Jew to walk around York Avenue um, in the late 30s. There were so many pro-Nazis walking around. If anyone suspected you were a Jew, well, they'd beat the beat the the crap out of you. I, I have that memory from my childhood. Let's give a salute to a great anti-Nazi feminist. Always, let's not forget a woman who stood up, Dorothy Thompson, wife of Sinclair Lewis, the great novelist. She actually started heckling uh, Fritz Kuhn during this demonstration, and she was escorted out of the garden. Uh, when Kuhn began his speech saying that the golden rule was that the Jews only followed the rule of gold. Now, let's think about maybe not the tension in New York City with the on, in, up in Yorktown or Yorkville, up, on, up, in, up, or up in the Upper East Side, but let's talk about America. Let's take a broad view of America in the 1940s where Chick is about to land and have his first apartment in on the Upper West Side. Uh, America's popular culture is best understood looking through popular magazines, and particularly this was the golden age of comic books. And this is not an accident, everybody, that you had cartoonists who were Jews, such as Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, both Jews who were creating the Captain America comics, comics, or Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel, the boys from Cleveland, who were using the comic books, cloaking their disguised Jewish identities to use the comic books as a vehicle for addressing America's isolationism and the apathetic American public. And so these comic books are treasures, particularly in 1940 and 41, to take the temperature of the isolationist American public. And this era of comic book, this is, you know, the lowest form. This is not reading literature. This is not, this is the stuff, but this is in the hands of kids and in the barber shops, sales doubled if between 1941 and 44, comic book sales doubled from 10 to 20 million copies in mass circulation. And through this very lowbrow, high to low culture, highbrow, lowbrow, what better effective propaganda showing the Axis uh, uh, leaders and having superheroes who were essentially the identities of these Jewish comic book illustrators to fight the war against fascism. Here we see Schick's uh, cartoon for 
a uh, anti-venereal disease prophylaxis. This was commissioned by the Wyeth Brother uh, Pharmaceutical Company. Prophylaxis prevents venereal disease. And again, lots of cartooning here, lots of caricature, and lots of discussion about while the Germans and the Italian images are a little more tame, note the, the uh, Asian uh, cartooning, which is at that time very strong, very powerful. But let's remember that 15 million men are about to sail off to Iwo Jima, to Japan. Uh, I remember William Styron telling me that he was on a troop ship right off of Japan in August of 1945. And if when you when you cannot use the lens, the obviously the racist imagery here, you cannot use the lens and retrofit the lens of 19 of 2023 with our understanding of this is so politically incorrect and retrofit it to a world war and where mass slaughters were going on. This was the language at that time. Superman gets into the act. Siegel and Schuster, look how early the date. America is not in the war yet, 1940. And in this dream sequence, imagine Hitler and Stalin, 1940. Stalin is still an ally of Hitler. Superman sweeps them up and pulls them to the world court in Geneva, Switzerland, to uh, fess up to their criminal crimes. This is fascinating political history through comic books. And Captain America uh, would also be in, in the fight. Now, it's through this popular culture of propaganda that we begin to understand how the language of Schick's art will be an effective tool. Now, we know of the unremitting propaganda machine of the Third Reich. And as we begin to think about how political propaganda is used in our own time and how we will judge it in the upcoming presidential election, we have to use these terms of ethos, pathos, and logos because we need to cut through and understand and deconstruct credibility, emotion, and logic, and how to spot political propaganda. And that's where Schick now reaches his full powers. He is uh, signed to uh, Collier's Magazine, and he will begin to unleash some of the most powerful images uh, he says the origin of all art is what we call propaganda. I do not say that art is my aim. Art is my means. That is quoted in the New York Post uh, during the war. He understands that he's going to have to use this because in 1940, we were still neutral, but then comes Pearl Harbor. Now the USA is in the big war. And this is where Polish Jewish artist Schick is unlike any other artist in the American scene on the newsstands, what he is going to do from that point. Look at his illustration of 1939 here on the left, Poland, the Christ of nations, after the invasion of Poland, which begins to uh, use the Chris, uh, Christian uh, iconography to talk about how Western civilization itself is about to be beholden to the attack on, on morality in this powerful image of Thomas R. Benton, the year of peril, 1941. And the war begins and the roundup and the Holocaust begins to go into high gear. The Museum of Modern Art has an exhibit on the National Poster Competition 19, in the winter of 1942-43. And here we see a fascinating retro view of the uses and abuses of propaganda for the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
And some of this propaganda is fascinating when you deconstruct it, how homesick American GIs were being asked to desert. And you had lots of racist imagery here being particularly developed by the by Germany and Japan to try to sway over American GIs to have them essentially desert their units and to understand that being homesick that they should uh, fall in line with with their uh, purposes, and this becomes then the imagery that is the Collier's cover. I think it's one of author Schick's most powerful and truly prescient cover. Ladies, if you look carefully, everybody, this was painted and created in September of 1941. It was published in the January 17, 1941 edition of Collier's, 40 days after Pearl Harbor, auguring a global struggle against totalitarianism. And yes, he uses the uh, imagery of Chaplin's The Great Dictator, and he transforms that into this imagery brilliantly executed for a magazine cover that the Third Reich was not to be limited to just conquering France, but the whole world was going to be uh, the objective as a world war was about to open up. Now the image here reminds me of the Vermeer painting we have in the Metropolitan Museum, the allegory of the Catholic faith, which was acquired by the Met in 1932. And so the satanic image of the, of the, the satanic uh, viper on the floor, this is an allegory of, of, of Christianity, of Catholicism versus the Protestant faith in the era of transition. This now is used by Schick. And I often wonder, did Schick see this on one of his first visits to the Metropolitan Museum once he arrives in New York in 1940? It's a fascinating, something I can never ever prove, but I think it's very close in its art historical reference. The Collier's cover, November 1941. We are here five weeks before Pearl Harbor. And here is a, a, a game of death, um, a, a game of, of uh, card sharps mimicking Hitler's deception and duplicity and dishonesty. Uh, the figure of a German general, death, is watching over as Hitler is holding in his hand three uh, cards, uh, Mussolini, uh, uh, Tojo, and uh, Marshal Pétain, and, and our, our new Russian allies, now that Russia has been duped and had attacked, our new Russian allies, and that is not a very friendly look in Ivan, is holding the United States and Great Britain as his allies. This is a fascinating iconographical study because the idea of who is holding the cards and how the Axis powers were going to play the cards is fascinating how it would be used again in other illustrations. And you see it here in detail, Ivan holding the USA and the UK, whereas Mussolini, the Vichy French Pétain, and Japan's Emperor Hirohito are in the hands of Hitler. Now, we all know the iconic Four Freedoms of Norman Rockwell. We all know this up in Stockbridge, up at the Rockwell Museum. This I printed in the millions, distributed across the United States. What I'd like everyone to appreciate that the four freedoms, which come from FDR's State of the Union speech of January 1941, as the rationale for sending 16 million troops into harm's way, uh, let's understand that Schick signed his four freedom images late in 1942. He actually 
predated Rockwell in the iconographical symbolization of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom uh, from fear, freedom of worship, all of this fascinating. Who would know that this Polish immigrant is almost a year ahead of Rockwell? Ben Heck, the playwright and um, author of so many texts, uh, authors the Ballad of the Doomed Jews of Europe. And it is uh, Schick who does the illustration for Ben Heck, uh, 4 million appearing in the New York Times, Tuesday, September 14, 1943, the Ballad of the Doomed Jews of Europe. We can look in detail at it. It reappeared in the New York Times without Schick's illustration, the gruesome image of Jews being strung up. This is, of course, now we're into uh, 43 when news, Rabbi Stephen Wise is bringing the tragic news to the attention of President Roosevelt in the White House that a mass slaughter is going on. Two million Jews have already been killed. And Ben Hecht writes, four million Jews waiting for death. Oh, hang and burn, quiet Jews. Don't be bothersome. Save your breath. The world is busy with other news. And here is Schick's brilliantly uh, painted, like um, almost like a medieval manuscript, like the pages of the uh, the Lamborg brothers, the, the something a uh, Flemish manuscript showing the Jews uh, in these are, I know these are difficult images to look look at, uh, but I uh, can't really discuss Schick without the honesty of this. And let's remember also working at this time uh, is the beloved uh, Theodore Geisel, the great Dr. Seuss, who was also uh, doing illustrations for PM Magazine. And he also is showing gruesome images of the uh, Holocaust that is uh, coming to light in front of the American public. And uh, recently I had the pleasure of interviewing Art Spiegelman and Spiegelman's Mouse series uh, developed about the story of his own parents who survived Auschwitz is a continuation of this visual uh, legacy. Schick does this cartoon that I want to share with you. It's of a black American GI. This is dated 1944 with his white companion. They've just arrested some Nazis and officers and the American GI guarding the captured German officers says, the white soldier says, well, what would you do with Hitler? And the black soldier answers, I would have made him a Negro and dropped him somewhere in the USA. Where lynchings, remember the Whitney Museum's powerful exhibit about lynching in America. So here is Schick, this Polish immigrant who is not only fighting the war and with his uh, mother and brother still trapped in Poland, not only is he fighting the war, but he's alerting the American public. He's um, giving as much of a uh, indication about what is going on in the Third Reich and how race, racial politics in America are using are of the same uh, of the same caliber in terms of the violence here against innocent black Americans. And uh, this type of uh, uh, racialization, remember the American armed forces were uh, segregated uh, uh, until uh, the late 1940s. And here we see uh, it, there's going to be a new uh, film uh, created uh, with uh, uh, the heroic 761st Tank Battalion, the, the, the original Black Panthers. And this is going to be part of this story of race in World War II. Schick caught the attention of Eleanor Roosevelt, 
who writes in her My Day, in her nationally syndicated column, My Day, on January 8, 1943, she writes, after seeing the Schick exhibit at the Siegelman Gallery, she says, I know of no other miniaturist doing quite this kind of work in its fight it's the war against Hitlerism as truly as any of us who cannot actually be on the fighting fronts today. Uh, this is a portrait done of FDR. It's dated 1944. Uh, it is given to Mrs. Roosevelt in 1946 from authorship FDR's Soldier in Art. And today this belongs to the Roosevelt Library at Hyde Park. Schick uh, is becoming very successful as an illustrator, uh, working for the major magazines and in Manhattan. Uh, beginning in 1941, he begins to come up to Westport, Connecticut, and summering in Westport with celebrities like the Gershwins and celebrities that were living up here. Uh, the Douglas Fairbanks was living in part of the famous Westport Playhouse. And let's remember that uh, Connecticut still had its uh, racial laws at that time. Um, we In Connecticut, we had real estate covenants that were held on the books in many Connecticut towns until 1968 until the Federal Fair Housing Act, uh, so that anti-Semitism was very evident, still even here in Connecticut. Uh, it, was a, it was perfectly legal to um, prohibit an African, a Negro, a Japanese, Chinese, Jewish, or anyone of the Hebrew race to own property. And many of these communities, even surrounding my own university, had these covenants, uh, which, of course, for Schick, he would uh, attack with his pen. And we see those covenants dramatically made into that uh, great American classic, The Gentleman's Agreement, uh, Daryl F. Zanuck's film about anti-Semitism in Darien, Connecticut. Schick is living uh, in the town right next door in New Canaan. So here again, this Polish immigrant, totally aware of benign or hidden or sort of country club anti-Semitism, and he is ferociously going to fight it, whether he's fighting Hitlerism in the Third Reich or anti-Semitism here in beautiful, leafy Fairfield County, he is going to expose it, a man who is not going to uh, kowtow to any type of, oh, you're being too uppity and you're, you're, you're making life uncomfortable for us. Uh, here is Laura Hobson's great book, Gentleman's Agreement. And it is right here in the town of New Canaan that Schick buys his first house on Weed Street. And here's a wonderful check he wrote to the local news, New Canaan newspaper. He uh, creates a wonderful uh, recreation of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and it's signed New Canaan, Connecticut, July 4, 1950. Uh, here again, he's doing everything he can to uh, enmesh himself into the values of the virtues of American free expression, freedom, uh, belief in religious tolerance and such. Schick uh, paints this dramatic uh, Declaration of Independence for the State of Israel in 1948. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry to share with you that this original artwork is lost. We don't know where it is, who owns it. Uh, it has been widely reproduced. It is Schick's version of the creation of the State of Israel, the Declaration of the State of Israel which he created in New Canaan, Connecticut, 1948, showing in details Kibbutzniks, female and male Haganah fighters, a very dramatic uh, recreation of the freedom fighting of 
the foundation of the state of Israel. And uh, in one of the very first uh, state of Israel bonds signed rather dramatically by Chaim Weitzman and David Ben-Gurion, it is Schick's uh, illustration of the founding generation of the kibbutzniks of Israel that was used on this uh, wonderful document, one of the first bonds sold for the state of Israel in 1951. Well, you can imagine with his sense of freedom and from his journey from uh, Nazi-occupied Europe that Schick is uh, a lefty, and uh, he is listed in April 1949 uh, as a subversive. Uh, he is uh, actually listed um, nine times as a member of the Communist Party uh, seeking world peace. And like the story of J. Robert Oppenheimer that we saw recently in the film, uh, we see that Schick is uh, named as a communist because of seeking racial desegregation, national health insurance, nuclear conciliation, arms control with the USSR. And so he is named, he is uh, cited in the House of Un-American Activities as a dangerous um, immigrant to America, along with Einstein, Howard Fast, Norman Mailer, Arthur Miller, Oppenheimer, Dorothy Parker, Ben Sean, Studs Terkel, and Arthur Schick. The anti-Semitism of uh, that time was uh, the um, disaster that he, he faced. And we know that he was very outspoken um, in not only as as a um, as an, an immigrant, but as an as an American who understood the dangers of this type of racial and religious uh, bigotry. Schick is. Uh, really uh, being uh, hounded out uh, and being sought after. And we wonder, uh, as we look at that, here's a billboard in Times Square that after 75 years of gas chambers, uh, a billboard calling out Jewish hate isn't an overreaction. Uh, Schick uh, was definitely identified and called upon and here we see you know this repre this reprehensible anti-jewish protesting of gassing the jews outside of the sydney opera house and so he's aware he's aware then that it was time to move on that the war was over that the events of hiroshima and nagasaki was time to move on forgetting the horrors of the past and so we ask the questions of why why many of us, when when I name, when I speak to people that I was doing, I've been working for several years on the work of Arthur Schick, I had people saying, we never heard of Arthur Schick. Uh, Schick uh, found himself as a soldier in art. Uh, he transformed his studio into a full throttle, one man anti-fascist propaganda outlet. He was among leading American artists of the era, like Wyeth, Benton, Rockwell, Leyendecker, they were, he was creating anti-fascist posters at the time, but Schick was the only major magazine illustrator that the fate of his mother, Eugenia, and his brother, Bernard, were not known. His mother was gassed to death and his brother killed in 1943. So though he was a famous illustrator at that time, he was suffering a personal tragedy with the loss of his family. And what we have here is in, in a time in the post-Auschwitz era, uh, Schick's art was not really fully appreciated at the time. Uh, the word Holocaust does not enter into the 
Library of Congress until 1968. The Anne Frank Diary is not dramatized until 1955. Schick's art styles progressed and shift dramatically. Rejection of now eclipsed American social realism of the 30s. War, his work was considered obsolete. We, of course, the triumph of the New York School, the triumph of abstract expressionism marks his transformative, this transformative period in American art and his realist art, almost too gruesome, was largely forgotten. And I think that there's also a feeling that his work was simply too Jewish. That is, uh, many members of the uh, art world actually were hiding their Jewish identity, disguising their Hebraic origins or familiar roots. But Schick was, uh, his work was unappealing. Um, he was reputationally, he had slipped off the radar screen of America. And Today, we see a revival of interest in his work. Uh, the uh, synagogue in Forest Hills has a gigantic 30-foot high arc that Schick did the drawings and did the uh, gilded, the plastered and gilding. And uh, this is, I'm happy to say that the synagogue is closing and that this massive New York arc is going to find a new home um, in a museum. So the story of Arthur Schick is the story of, of a, an artist who lived through and was always to the end an artist to be remembered. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip, for showing us not only Schick's work, but how it fits into 20th century American art, 20th century um, art thinking, and also how it really kind of resonates with us today, given the circumstances we're in now, and especially the idea that um, fascism, Nazism, and authoritarianism is still alive and well. And uh, if Schick were here today, we could certainly use his voice and his pen. So speaking of voices and pens, let's see who has written in the chat. Um, Laura Einstein has a question. So Laura, if you'd like to unmute yourself, uh, would you like to do that and ask the question? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my video is not on, but- I'll so turn Philip. your camera. I'll turn your camera oh. on. All right, thank you. Okay. Hi, Philip. So I curated the exhibition for Arthur Schick and New Canaan. And I have a question that is somewhat multifaceted for Philip, that Arthur Schick moved to New Canaan, a town of uh, 22 square miles, historic significance in uh, 1750s, historically a non-Jewish town. He supported Arthur uh, Leo Davidoff uh, and Ida Davidoff, uh, Close friends, was, yes. Yes, and in fact, Ida Davidoff was best friends with um, Anne Mara Lindbergh. Wow, wow. So, so regardless of uh, Lindbergh's fascism or tie to um, Hitler, Anne Mara Lindbergh was very good friends best friends with um, Ida Davidoff. So how did this man in 1951 move to New Canaan and support the moving to New Canaan of Leo Davidoff, who was the head of surgery at uh, Einstein Medical Center? Uh, how, do you how do you equate that uh, why did he move there? Why did he, and I know that Uwe, and a second question is Irving Unger has a very successful business uh, selling Arthur Schick work and um, Arthur Schick has been looked for and to. So I think there's a couple, there are a couple things that have left unsaid here. Okay, well, I'm I'm not sure what what's 
What, what so is Arthur? So Arthur Schick did the Declaration of Independence. He did Kosciuszko. He did very American scenes in a typically new American town. Yes. So I support you in the call to action in this terrible time. But I also think there was something that Arthur Schick was looking for in the town of New Canaan, that he was the first Jewish man to get property there. Uh, he supported supported other Jews in getting property in New Canaan. Uh, I think there's more to the story. I, Laura, I think that's a fascinating uh, avenue of inquiry. I, I, I've gone to the historical society. I've looked in their, uh, their um, archives. Uh, I, I'm a little bit uh, un floored Unfair to understand what. what yeah, I mean, it's. I I I'm certain that they came to New Canaan with the Davidoff family. They were. No, he came before the Davidoff family and he supported them in buying property. And he wrote letters on their behalf. Before the Davidoffs. Okay. Yes, he was the first Jew to. Oh, that's... Yeah. That's... So why oh, would man. he. How he and, landed and in I'm New not Canaan. I'm challenging you, but I'm, I, and I hope it doesn't sound like that, but. Um, why wouldn't he move to Great Neck? <laughs> I mean, why wouldn't he move to many other towns that were more Jew friendly if that was the case? He was the first Jew to get property in New Canaan. He dies in 51. Uh, he does tremendous number of scenes of uh, independence, the Constitution, uh, against uh, Hitler, but he, it seems like he was dipping his toe into two worlds. Or I think we have another chapter to write. <laughs> Thank now, you. I have a question oh. from, or a, a question from James Ingalls, who Thank says, you. first of all, awesome presentation. Although Schick was an illustrator, are there major collectors or collections of his artwork? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, Schick's work is, as I said, a large body of it was purchased by uh, the um, Museum for Los Angeles, um, the Illustration Museum, uh, which, will, which will open up in 2025. Mm -hmm. uh, but doesn't the it exhibition uh, the exhibition comes from a single collection, doesn't it? Uh, the 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 Schick estate was curated by a very devoted um, former rabbi who gave up his pulpit, Irving Ungar, who uh, essentially has devoted his his most of his adult life since uh, the I'm going to say since the uh, 1980s to the legacy of Arthur Schick, and that collection was purchased um, for the University of California at Berkeley. Um, it is it is now in the the great museum out at Berkeley, out in the Jewish out in the Jewish uh, museum out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Are there any other questions or comments? If uh, if anyone would like to speak, thank you, Laura. Feel free to thank you, Laura. Okay. Um, then um, I will say thank you again to Philip for an absolutely fascinating and wide ranging. I mean, sometimes we look at artists through a very narrow lens, but I don't think this lens could have been any broader and it was all the better for that. Uh, this Art in Focus talk is the second of our third in this series. So next week we're skipping, but on Tuesday, November 7th at 6 p.m., Prudence Pfeiffer, the Museum of Modern Arts Director of Content 
will take us inside the bohemian world of the slip, the New York City street that changed America forever. And I hope you'll be with us for that. And good evening, everyone.